welcome to The Social Capitalist with host and Never Eat Alone co-author Tal Raz. Social Capitalist events are sponsored programming of My Greenlight, an exclusive online learning platform for relationship development skills. For more information, visit our webpage at www.mygreenlight.com. Enjoy the event. Hello, my name is Tal Roz, co-founder of My Greenlight and host of The Social Capitalist, where we bring you analysis and advice on this new era of social business. We have two special guests today. John Hagel is a thought leader at the intersection of business strategy and technology. John Seeley Brown is the former chief scientist of Xerox. Together, they co-chair Deloitte's Center for the Edge. Their most, the power of the power, power of pool, describes a new world in which the merging of globalization and digital technology has unleashed a boundless, constant, and accessible flow of ideas, capital, talent, and opportunity. Tapping that flow, they argue, is the key to both organizational and individual productivity, growth, and prosperity. It's a real honor to have both of you on the show. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. To start, provide some context. What is the power of pool, and how is it related to this notion of of flow? I like to say if we had were able to summarize it, we wouldn't have written a book. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's um, the power of pull as, as we talk about it is the opportunity to increasingly draw out people and resources when you need them and where you need them. Uh, and if done right, we think it actually creates a potential for increasing returns in business activity where the more participants that join in, the more value that gets created uh, as, a, as a group. And so it counters a lot of the traditional ways of doing business, which we would characterize as a push approach where you essentially have to specify in advance, based on a forecast or prediction, exactly where people and resources need to be placed uh, at what point in time in order to meet that demand. So it's, a, it's, in one respect, a way to deal with increasing uncertainty, more rapid change, and the extreme events that increasingly seem to, to uh, pop up unexpectedly around the world. And in terms of its relationship to flow, maybe the best way to describe that is that you talk about levels of pool, uh, which seem to me um, different levels of, of sort of how to interact with that flow. Is that is that a right? Uh, is that the yeah, right I, characterization? I think, so one way one way of framing it, it, it in, we talk about the big shift, and and one way of framing it is moving from a world of push to pull. Another way is uh, framing it as moving from a world of stocks to flows. And this is where flows come into play. It's the notion that in the past, you, you became successful in business by developing proprietary knowledge, protecting that aggressively, and then uh, efficiently extracting the value of that knowledge and delivering it to the marketplace. The problem in more rapidly changing environments is that anything you know at any point in time is depreciating at an accelerating rate. Um, And so the name of the game at that point becomes how do you participate in a broader, more diverse range of flows of knowledge so that you can refresh your knowledge stocks at an increasing rate. Um, And part of that is through harnessing these mechanisms of pull so that you're drawing out um, the people, the knowledge, uh, the learning when you need it, where you need it. But the flows become a key focus uh, in, in driving pull platforms. How do you maximize the knowledge flow that's available um, to, the, to uh, the participants? So in a way, you may say <clears throat> that um, in the world of push, the basic strategic aim was how do you uh, leverage scalability, how do you leverage size? Um, and, and almost all corporate strategies use moving down the experience curve as their competitive edge in terms of how do they build better products, cheaper, and so on and so forth. In this other world, this world of pull, if you wish, um, we're shifting from looking at leveraging um, scalability to leveraging learning. And so the catch here is how do you participate on the edge in ways that is more than just listening. It actually is doing things on the edge 
So you're picking up kind of tacit knowledge at the same time you're picking up new kinds of explicit knowledge. And that rich combination of learning in the action on the, uh, on the edge so much, so, so to speak, is kind of key. I, I want to get uh, eventually back to uh, the distinction of tacit and explicit knowledge, which I don't think people understand fully. But um, as just a, as a brief digression, it, you know, it, you guys are very adept at, at – um, it, it all seems incredibly uh, complex for people who haven't – and it is, but for people who haven't read the book, what some of this language might um, hide is the fact that um, your the, 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 the painting of the world as it uh, is going to become uh, that you've, you've sketched out in, in the book um, focuses quite a bit on, um, on ideas and notions that business is conventionally thought of as, as soft, notions of, of networking and emotional intelligence and soft skills and, and things like that. Is, is it, would you say that, that, you know, this is created, was this a surprise to you um, that, that there would be so much focus on these concepts? I, I don't think, uh, I, frankly, it was a surprise to either of us that we come to this with a very strong focus on the interplay between technology and people and, and how technology reshapes and amplifies uh, relationships across people. So I think that if you look at both the writing that JSB has done historically and the writing that I've done, that's been a very consistent kind of theme for us, uh, is never just focusing on technology, never just focusing on the hard, the hard dimensions, if you will, um, but really understanding how and where this is going to reshape relationships and both the challenges that that creates and, and increasingly the opportunity as well. So you might say this in, in, a, in a nutshell is a shift from a purely technical to a socio-technical point of view. And that that shift to a social-technical view, I, I, you know, we have gone in our own work and in, in, in social capital and and um, interpersonal relationships and working with business, we find that you know a lot of your C-level executives and middle management view this all as touchy-feely, especially given sort of, you know, the, the process of indoctrination at most business schools. Um, and even, you know, I saw that a, one Amazon reviewer remarked, um, you know, there's a critique like, spare me the conceit that every workplace can be rendered artisanal. It, have you encountered that uh, kind of resistance uh, about these ideas? Uh, have, you, have you dealt with any of it? On a daily basis. <laughs> No, I think that that's exactly the, the push mindset is all about, again, rig, rigid and, and tightly specified activities that are performed according to the process manual and anything that smacks of um, being able to experiment, to tinker, to um, connect with others in un unexpected ways uh, is, is an anathema to, to the traditional executive. So. It, 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 it's just a very consistent with the mindset, uh, the push mindset, which says it's not the task of people is to fit in to the organization as specified and to follow the instructions as specified. What we would suggest in a pull organization is it's the task of the organization to adapt to the individuals and to help the individuals become more effective at what they're doing and learn faster uh, and improve their performance more rapidly in ways that just weren't feasible in the past. You know, the one catch maybe here also is that if you talk to the very top of the corporation, the, the C-suite, especially the CEO, it's not surprising if you get them to think about it, is most of what what makes them so special has come through experiential learning. It's not book learning. It never has been book learning. It is their ability to, to you know, accumulate a rich set of experiences, step back and interpret those experiences, embody those experiences, and so on. So experiential learning uh, is something that, that people at the top do understand. Uh, and in a way, that's another pathway in 
because what we're really talking about in these acts of participation are in some sense amplifying experiential learning. But when you go to how do you organize the corporation below the C-suite, they never think this way. And so there's a huge gap between how they understand how they're so good versus they want these you know, replicatable uh, automatons below them. Hmm. So, so let's dig deeper into these concepts, uh, and we'll start with um, uh, because of what you've, you've just been talking about, the, the learning. It seems like the, the, the flow, and actually let me just make a, a point, is, is flow uh, synonymous with network, or is there, is there a distinction to be had there? Uh, it partly de depends on how you define network. I, I think flow it, it focuses on interactions across among people. Uh, sometimes that occurs over a physical network, like a, a telephone or internet. Uh, sometimes it occurs as people gather around the, the uh, coffee machine um, and or on the street in an unexpected encounter. But th the notion is how do you enhance the connections, the interactions across people so that knowledge is uh, not only exchanged. I think one of, the, one of the issues we have with the concept of flow is it, is it tends to put people in the mindset of it's just about the transfer of knowledge. Somebody has knowledge, how does it, how does it flow to other people? A lot of what we see as the value of flow is creating a set of interactions where through the interaction, new knowledge is being created, or you're taking different perspectives, different experiences and skill sets, and by ch tackling very challenging problems, flowing into a new set of insights that will, in fact, help everybody to learn and become better at what they're doing. Well, so, ex so explain, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, at its core, um, you know, yeah, it turns out to be a, f a fairly interesting, pretty replicatable study now um, that looked at how do you predict um, how well someone would do uh, in college um, and you know, as they enter college or as they the first year of college and uh, universities. And uh, it turns out that GPAs, SAT, SATs, all this stuff, none of those things turn out to be predictive. Um, it's the single thing that predicted success in college was did these students or did this student know how to either create or join a study group? And think about what goes on in a study, study group, everything John just talked about. I mean, in some sense, how do you come together with a group? How do you form that group? How do you work with each other? How do you make personal the knowledge uh, that comes uh, in, and how do you, through conversation, kind of come to own this in a very deep way, but also create new knowledge? Just like you know, a good conversation typically creates something beyond uh, the sum of the, what each person has. Somehow, it scaffolds something new into coming, into being. So I think that the, you know, at root, we're looking at something very fundamental about learning that's just being ignored by the way um, you design your workplace. So, JC, could you could you explain though? You know, the importance of that study seems to be that they the that they've they've connected with the study group, so they've exposed themselves to experiential learning, and experiential learning uh, it, it allows people to or provides the the um, uh, 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 platform from which uh, this specific kind of knowledge, this this knowledge you call tacit knowledge, can be learned. Can you describe at that? Um, in as it uh, how it's different from explicit knowledge and why it's become so important today. Well, first of all, let me correct you on a tiny point. Um, part of what I said is you learn how to join. Knowing how to join something is non-trivial, uh, and also knowing how to create something yourself. So these kids either created their own study groups. And think about that as a kind of an interesting piece of innovation. And how do you actually build a study group? How do you monitor what goes on? How, what's the coaching that goes on? What's the peer mentoring that goes on in a study group? Um, and so the social dynamics, joining, building, and, and, and operating in a study group, has some interesting social properties to it that we can map back on to the workplace in pretty interesting ways. 
the um, but you know the catch is that, that so much of of what we actually know we don't even know how to articulate. It's not been commoditized. It's not been made a commodity that can be you know articulated explicitly. Um, and so the simplest examples are you know I can show you how to you know, I'll get you into riding a bike, um, but there's no way I can tell you how to ride a bike. You know I can kind of create conditions for you to be able to experience. And, you know, uh, by trial and error, learning how to ride a bike and, and make that a very fast, effective experience. But I'm not going to be able to talk you into being an expert dentist, an expert bike rider, and so on and so forth. So there always has been a very classical distinction between the explicit knowledge and the know-how knowledge. It kind of lives in a pre-articulate form, um, you know, in your own self. And so, so much of making knowledge personal actually brings it into action inside you. Um, um, and in that sense of action, it really matters to us so much. And that's why this participation, by the way, is such a key notion. It's not just listening. I, I would also add, I think, that this is one of the reasons that we put so much emphasis on, um, a, again, a soft skill, which is how do you build trust-based relationships? Um, because... It, JSB and many years ago made made the formulation that in fact tacit knowledge doesn't flow. It's very sticky. Uh, it's within ourselves. It's within our heads, and we're very reluctant to share it or or to even expose it um, unless we trust the people we're with. I mean, the process of trying to uh, access that tacit knowledge, we're going to stumble, we're going to fumble, we're not going to have the right words, um, and we're not going to do that if we don't trust the, the people we're with. And so if you can't build those trust-based relationships, you're going to have a very hard time accessing this tacit knowledge. And in fact, in a rapidly changing world, the tacit knowledge is where a lot of the value and insight is. You know, think about the explicit knowledge that's written in textbooks. It takes a year, two years, three years to get that textbook out. By the time it's out and written and codified, it's old news. The new stuff mm. is in the people's heads that they've just experienced, and getting them to act, being able to access that is where trust-based relationships become so central. And when you're and when you're both referring to tacit knowledge, you're not referring to necessarily a, a, um, a, a kind of a, a know-how that remains that, that that remains static across environments and professions, but that there is a there is a, a kind of tacit knowledge that's that's um, that you find in every kind of workplace, uh, or depending on what you do. Is that is that the idea? Yes. I mean, I, I would I would say so. I mean, tacit knowledge is active, is always is, is what I would call radically contingent. It kind of comes into being when the context is just right and you're interacting with it. So you know, it it, it is constantly kind of reinventing itself, so to speak, uh, in situ. So uh, the essence of kind of situated learning behind it as well. Does it does it have any relationship, by the way, to the, that? Uh, that so, sort of old, ambiguous concept of, of, you know, people refer to as street smarts? Uh, I, I think it has a fair amount to do with street smarts. Um, but, but let's go back to what John said a moment ago in terms of trust. I go back to mm -hmm. the simplest little example I just gave in terms of learning how to ride a bicycle. You know, if right. the kid who you're teaching doesn't trust you to catch him or her when, when they fall, um, they're going to be very hesitant to try. And so the kinds of things we're talking about are highly provisional and is often filled with the willingness to kind of expose shortcomings and failure. And so in some sense, there's another reason why kind of trust matters so much. You, you know, it's very hard to have a, a, an open generative conversation if it's a legal dip, 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 um, this, how do you say it? The deposition. Deposition. Yes, but, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, to take the extreme case. Uh, so, I mean, I think that, you know, you just think about two radically different kind of settings and you see the difference. 
There's okay. another uh, element in terms of this tacit knowledge that I think is interesting. We've, you find that whenever there's a new area of innovation or rapid development of knowledge, um, you tend to see lots of conferences emerge in those areas. One of the key indicators of an emerging area is the number of conferences that are held. And what you find when you go there is the people at, at, in the conferences speaking are not showing charts of, of numbers and, and data analysis. They're largely telling stories. Uh, they're telling, and, and to JSB's point, it, stories are very powerful because they situate the experience in a context. Part of the story is the context. Here's, here's where I was and what, what I experienced. And it's a way to start to communicate some of that, that tacit knowledge, uh, but it's putting it in the context of that particular person's experience in a particular place and time. So yep. You know, and, <laughs> and it's also a second property of those conferences that John was talking about is you also spend more time in the hallways talking. So it's the coffee breaks that turn out to be probably more important or as important. So you kind of hear the stories and you come out and start talking about the stories. You try to make them personal. Uh, you try to see how they map onto your own personal experiences. And so that social dynamic is a key part of picking up something new. So to, building on that point, um, the the, the criticality of social dynamics, uh, you write, social networks constructed in the right way can provide leaders with an unparalleled opportunity to achieve their potential. And throughout the work, you know, net, it's very clear networks are critical, how you build them, leverage them, maintain them, um, even particular areas of a network to cultivate that serve particular purposes. It's a, it's a, it's a whole new way, a whole a far more rigorous structured way of, of looking at how we at, at how we build our community around ourselves. Do you see uh, in the long term technology, uh, perhaps with the emergence of the social graph, eventually stepping in to guide this process for people, helping them to structure and curate their networks? It certainly helps them to amplify their networks. Um, and I think one of the one of the interesting things here is the tendency of some people when they uh, encounter a social network platform to connect with people that are just like them. And mm -hmm. it, 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 at one level, that becomes a very um, insular, uh, inward-looking kind of, of set of flows. You're just reinforcing each other's biases and beliefs as opposed to how can you use these networks to extend out and connect to people from very different backgrounds and experiences, but who might actually have some value to offer. And, and not just to do it in a, in a, in a um, structured or predetermined way of I'm going to connect with this person, but just being alert. I mean, one of the great things for me about Facebook is when I'm on a friend's page, seeing some of the other people and what their comments are, people I've never met before, don't even know, didn't even know they existed. But their comments suggest that they've actually been thinking about something or experiencing something very similar to what I'm working on. And so the opportunity for what we call serendipity, those unexpected encounters, um, where you don't even know the person to find, but you run into them, uh, becomes more and more valuable in a world that's rapidly changing. We don't even know what questions to ask or who to look for. Mm. It, so, it, well, that that speaks directly to my point. I, I guess one, I was asking whether you thought, you know, LinkedIn now is a, is it essentially a a kind of uh, uh, well, it's a glorified uh, content management system. But eventually, if there's any way of, uh, you know putting some intelligence underneath it, you know, what kind of goals you want and where it eventually be, that system would tell you what kind of network you would need to build. In the absence of that, um, it is a very fuzzy process. So what do you prescribe to people for, for what they should, how, how would they do it themselves? How, you know, there's not a lot out there um, in terms of, of, of 
you know, here's how you should audit your network. These are the ways you should build it. Do you have specific advice around that? Uh, I think sure. John, yeah, John, yeah, you ought to go through the, the shaping serendipity because that's just, I think, the most elegant answer to that kind of question. Yeah, I think we, we take a, a view that's, uh, to many people, somewhat uh, unexpected, which you know, most people, when they think of serendipity, think of it as something that's totally luck. You can't plan for it. You can't in any way shape it. Uh, it just happens when it happens. The best thing you can do is be prepared for it when it does happen and be alert to the opportunity. We actually take a view that you can shape serendipity. You can, in a very significant way, increase both the probability and the quality of those unexpected encounters by choices you make. I mean, and it can get to, I mean, we talked earlier about this notion of conferences. So where you spend your time matters a lot. Going to a conference, you're much more likely, if you think about the right kinds of conferences, to run into people that again, you, you didn't know existed, but through these hallway conversations, sitting at lunch, whatever, uh, you suddenly connect to people that actually have some very interesting similar kinds of experiences. Um, even the, at a simpler level, how tightly do you schedule your day? If you're in back-to-back -back meetings with people that you are intent on meeting, that you know or, or want to know, you leave no space for serendipity, for those unexpected encounters, versus having some time where you can walk the hall or walk the street. Um, another, another point that we emphasize a lot is the notion, actually, with all these social networks and technology platforms that are available, physical space still matters. Your decision about where you live is going to significantly increase the the potential for serendipity, or decrease it, depending on where you live. And it's one of the reasons we think cities, even with all this world is flat and technology is able to connect you anytime, anywhere, cities increasingly matter to people. They're moving more rapidly into cities, even with all this technology. In part, we think because they at least intuitively have a sense this is going to increase um, your potential for serendipity for those unexpected encounters. The implication of, of that is that y you would increase your serendipity, larger your, net larger your net network, the more serendip serendipity you would bring into your life. Um, I, I wonder if that... By the way, that, and, that, and that, 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 that doesn't follow. Hmm. I mean, because basically, you know, you, uh, the bigger the echo chamber I build, I don't necessarily get brand new ideas, number one. Two... You know, how do I put things out about me that kind of attracts new people to come into my network? I mean, so the size of the network per se, you know, is not that determinist. And it's kind well, of that's, that's the, what I would – perhaps you can – so clarify. I mean, you, you, you actually explicitly say um, in, in, I think, one of the articles I read that in opposition to the, the theory that, you know, Dunbar's uh, number that we can only really maintain 150 relationships, that given technology, our networks can be much larger. And you see, you know, 5,000 plus friends on this one or that one uh, network. But I, I wonder, you know, and this is along the sort of Sherry Turkle line, that perhaps networks may scale, but but intimacy doesn't. Is there, is there, is the, uh, Rewards of growing a large uh, network conflict with the uh, uh, rewards of building trust-based relationships. Can the two coexist? I, from my perspective, they not only can coexist, but, but need to coexist. Um, it's not to say it's inevitable. I think Sherry Turkle, who I know well, is, is quite right that in, for many people, they use uh, social networks and technology as ways to create the illusion of intimacy as opposed to um, the reality of it. But I, I do think that this constant working back and forth between, on the one hand, finding ways to reach out and, and encounter new people that you didn't know existed, but on the other hand, being able to draw in those people into relationships 
when it when it matters. I, I don't think we would say that you have to draw in all your network at, at, in equal ways at, at all times, but it's it's based on the specific situation you're in. Who can be most helpful to me, and how can I connect with them in ways that build these trust-based relationships as opposed to just viewing it as totally opportunistic where, you know, I'm, I'm going to pay you for something and get something in return. Well, mm. Or said, I mean, a key part of this trust is how many interactions do you do draw in? Um, is there a sense of reciprocity? You're getting something about how are they getting something in return? Or it may be not tit for tat, but I mean, like, you know, that whole sense of contributing as well as receiving, um, kind of is the beginning of growing some of this trust. And, and one, of, one of the ways that this intimacy gets created and this trust gets generated is by doing something that, that's very counter to what most business school textbooks would tell you uh, to do, which is you know, one of my big pet peeves right now is this whole notion of personal brand. Or essentially, your task is to go into these social networks and present all the great accomplishments and strengths you have. And if you have any weaknesses, keep them well hidden because that's going to be your brand. Your brand. Um, whereas our view is that actually, by going out into these networks and expressing vulnerability in the form of, at, at a minimal level, just here's a problem I'm working on. I haven't found a solution to it. I don't know the answer. Does anybody have any ideas out there who can help me? You know, you're expressing vulnerability. You don't know the answer. But you're also sending out a signal, what we call a beacon, to draw in people who might have ideas and insight. And by the way, the fact that you've expressed vulnerability makes them more willing to express vulnerability and build trust as a result of that interaction. So it's a very counterintuitive kind of notion, but essential if you're really going to leverage the full value of the networks you're creating. Do, do you, are there any other uh, sort of contrarian notions of how to navigate these social networks that, that, that you guys prescribe that go against kind of uh, uh, conventional wisdom? Oh boy! Um, <laughs> let me count the ways. I, you know, I think there's part of it. <laughs> virtually all conventional wisdom here needs to get thrown out. It's, um, hmm. you know, I think again the, this notion of of viewing these networks as very instrumental, where your job is to promote yourself and what you're doing. Um, actually, a lot of the trust and, and the the productive encounters in these networks gets built by promoting other people. You know, share what, you know, if you come across somebody else's insight or interesting thing, by sharing that, you do two things. One is you build um, credibility with the person that you shared the, the insight from, and you build credibility with people who say, wow, that's really interesting. And by the way, you weren't just doing this to promote yourself. You were helping me to connect to somebody else who had some really interesting ideas. So, so this is an example of reciprocity. Yes, exactly. And the notion of, of just provocation. I mean, you know, we, we're often taught not to be very careful and thoughtful about who we might offend and, you know, sensitivities and sensibilities. Yeah, at one level that's important, but at another level, if you're not provoking, if you're not getting people to engage, um, in a, in a more substantive, meaningful way around real problems or real issues that you're you're working on, you'll never get that level of, of insight and, and learning that, that occurs. We, we often talk about um, the notion of productive friction. Uh, you know, the, uh, our belief is that if you go into a company and see people seated, seated around conference tables smiling and nodding at each other and, and uh, reinforcing each other, um, that's a bad company. Mm. You know, because they're hiding their differences versus if you see people pounding the table and, and yelling at each other in some cases, if they're doing it with respect, I mean, it's, the key again is trust and, and respect for each other, but they're saying what they really think. 
we don't all agree all the time, and particularly when we're addressing really, really challenging problems, we're going to come at it with lots of different points of view. So friction can actually be quite productive. But let, let, let me reflect on <clears throat> what John has said in the last actually five minutes. You've heard him use the term challenging real problems. Okay. Um, and so it's just, uh, be, uh, being engaged in something that really does matter um, and that you really want to try to understand deeper and to solve something. This is not just um, let me give you an opinion or, oh, do you know how to um, change the setting on my PC to do X? I mean, you know, these are actually, you know, the pursuit of something very substantive and Already, you, know, you might not see that happen all that much, but even when it is happening, it may be more disguised than you first realized. So it may be more out there going on than you first realized. But there's a point of view of how do you engage on something that really does matter. Um, and I think that you know this has been overlooked a great deal by the social media crowd. Can you, when you say overlooked, can you explain that a little bit? I mean, I I don't think people go to use, you know, uh, most of social media to, uh, to really deepen an understanding of a major problem. Now, they may build a group, and that group may be dedicated toward that, or, you know, a collective in some sense could be doing that. But I, I just think that, um, you know, in a funny sort of way, um, social media has seemed to upplay kind of the superficial sociality as opposed to understanding that the social is the fabric which real understandings flow along. Now, does, does that sh is that shift, the shift that's required to understand that, is that, uh, or I should say, do, does the technology or the platform themselves need to change, or do the n mindsets of the people using the technology need to change to, to uh, I, embrace I would, that idea? Yeah, I, I would say neither. I'd say um, just any new technology offers up, offers up the possibility of inventing new genres of participation or uses of that technology. And so the, the practices, the social practices around the technology that really matter. And so, for example, you know, I've been bugging on for some time about, you know, please, please write a book on the social practices you use to become so effective in Facebook as an ideation platform, for example, et cetera. I mean, so, um, you know, so just think about, for take a very trivial example, the way you read Wikipedia is completely different than the way you read Britannica. We, uh, everybody knows the social practices for reading Britannica, and we grew up with them. But many people, especially when they first come to Wikipedia, are unaware that to use Wikipedia effectively, you start paying as much attention to the edit chain. You begin to see behind the scenes what part of this uh, entree, entry is still being contested. So all of a sudden, you know, Wikipedia gives you insight to the back room that you never got access to in Britannica in terms of the arguments behind the scenes of what should be put on the front stage. So I think that, you know, to use Wikipedia effectively, um, you have to kind of be willing to invent or incorporate a new practice, a new reading practice. And the same with much of what we're talking about here. Hmm. Okay. Um, I, I think I was all, I was, one of the reasons I brought up mindset is that um, it's, it's, it's uh, something that you consider a, a kind of uh, a large challenge um, to adapting to this new world. Can you, can you explain that a little bit? Well, I think it's, it's essentially the notion that we all have a natural tendency, particularly when we're successful, uh, to develop a set of assumptions about what drove our success. Um, often they're quite accurate, but conditions change. And we, yet we still have these assumptions that are built into us that we don't even, again, make explicit, much less challenge. Uh, and so we continue our behavior, our choices continue to be driven by those assumptions. 
Uh, and in a world that's more rapidly changing, that's a very dangerous um, uh, mm. approach. It's much more effective to, at a minimum, be explicit about the assumptions you have, but more importantly, to be constantly testing and challenging those assumptions to see if they still hold. Because when worlds change rapidly, assumptions have to be challenged. But, you know, as John was saying, it's surprisingly hard to even know the assumptions that you hold. And so think of this as a point of view or a mindset is more like a conceptual lens that you wear. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm really allergic to something here. Um, and, you know, if you wear a set of glasses, you're not even aware you're wearing the glasses. Most of the time you look at the world through, through the set of lenses you have on. Um, the catch is how do you actually go about regrinding a set of lenses? Um, well, that regrinding process is extremely tricky because many of these assumptions have now been, you know, uh, the, the, the warrants for them have been lost. You can't articulate them anyway. They've been incorporated into the, you know, the, uh, the mindset itself. Um, and so understanding how to actually start to torque this mindset and invent a new mindset is decidedly non-trivial. But that's why this kind of collaboration and participation in certain types of groups where you can kind of triangulate on how each other is seeing something. And if you trust each other, you can be challenged. And then through that challenging, you begin to unpack uh, and thereby maybe discover the assumptions that you had 20 years ago, but actually framed the way you see the world now in ways you've even forgotten about. Does this... Uh, one of the questions I have is, is some of these, uh, the, or, or, uh, lots of these changes um, and some of these, you know, the assumptions that you're, you, you were just talking about, um, younger generations don't have those same assumptions, right? So they were more influenced by um, the behavior and the, the, the technologies that now we're only trying to adapt to. Do you see that some of the techniques and the ideas that you're talking about um, in the book are because by virtue of, of, of these younger people growing up in this time that, that they're doing it without having to read about it or, um, you know, uh, that it's, it's, it's coming by, by the very nature of, of the time that they're, they're being raised? Or is, it, is this, are those ideas so present, some of the sort of old ideas so present in the institutions of learning and 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 so on that um, we're all going to have to um, go through this this process of change. I would say that there's an increasing friction, if you will. I mean, you mentioned institutions of education. Uh, we talked earlier about the push model of of organizing resources. Uh, traditional education is a classic example of push. The minute you're mm. born, I can tell you what you're going to need to learn in first grade, sixth grade, twelfth grade, wherever. I've predicted what you're going to need, and you're going to learn it. Um, and the kind of learning that we're talking about here is a very different kind of learning. And it's, it's really much more around what we've started to call dispositions as opposed to even skills. It's your orientation towards, towards life. Uh, what do, what What's your reaction when you confront an unexpected challenge? Do you try to avoid it because it's not what part of the plan? Or do you embrace it and say, wow, this is an opportunity to learn something that I, I didn't know before? Um, that disposition is going to determine in a, in a very big way how rapidly you learn in life. And yet schools are not in any way oriented towards cultivating those dispositions. They're, called, they're focused on a given set of knowledge, stocks of knowledge, that have to be communicated. In fact, the kind of key phrase that John just said is cultivating a disposition rather than teaching or transmitting a piece of knowledge. And so the question of how do you cultivate becomes a major question. And I, and I, I, just, so, have to, I just have to add that uh, you talked at the outset about soft elements here. Uh, one of the softest elements that we've we've engaged in is um, an increasing focus on the topic of passion. 
you know, what, what, what is the level of passion among the workforce? Uh, and one of the reasons we're so focused on it is because if you really have passion around an, an area, you have that questing disposition. You're constant. You don't even wait for these unexpected challenges to happen. You're seeking them out, and you get bored. You get uh, frustrated if you're not confronting these unexpected challenges. So it's it's a very um, powerful way to drive performance improvement and learning if you have that passion. If you don't have that passion, we believe you're never going to learn fast enough or improve your performance rapidly enough to remain successful in, in an increasingly pressured business environment. So, so in a way, passion unleashes two critical dispositions that come together. One, John just commented on, was the questing disposition. And the second, which we've been talking about this whole period, is the connecting disposition. If you can think about how do you quest and how do you connect in fulfilling that quest. And this goes back to the fact that quests are conversations. They aren't just casual observations. And so questing and connecting create the kind of fundamental platform that uh, those two dispositions become the way that you can then be willing to kind of embrace change, find adventures, and actually pursue passion. And it leads you to look at life completely differently than believing that, okay, now I've mastered this one set of skills and I can go repeating it after, you know, year after year after year and then retire. <laughs> and, so, and I mean, I, it, it, go uh, ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to add uh, the um, interesting thing to me, too, about this connecting disposition. If you have passion, you're not just motivated to reach out and meet people. But in the process of meeting them, you ra much more rapidly build trust. Uh, you know, think about anybody you know who's passionate. I guarantee within 30 minutes of meeting another person, that passionate person is talking about this incredible problem that they've been wrestling with and they can't figure out. And is there any, do you have any ideas or thoughts? They're, they in instinctively express vulnerability very quickly. They're not presenting a facade of a brand. They're, they're dealing with problems that excite them, and they want to share those problems and see if anybody has ideas, and that builds trust. The, the importance of passion and the way it uh, uh, puzzle pieces your sort of larger framework uh, is, is, is very easy to understand. Um, what is harder for me is given that you know, society today, uh, as you said, to sort of our educational system, certainly um, our organizations uh, do a miserable, miserable job at cultivating passion. Um, so, you know, it's almost become a, a place where passion is this, this kind of, uh, for so many, this, this amorphous concept that they believe that they just weren't built that way. Or they, you know, they just are, are, are it, they're, it's inevitably they're not uh, um, meant to experience that with, at least within, let's say, the realm of work or school. What do, what, what needs, what, what needs to change um, for, uh, for that to be different? Well, I, I think two reactions. One is you, you framed it as doing a miserable job of cultivating passion. I'd say they're doing an outstanding job of squashing passion. They're not, passion in a push-based world is deeply subversive. Passion is inherently unpredictable. In a world that depends on predictability, you cannot afford to have passion. You have to squash it as soon as it emerges. So I don't think it's an accident. I don't think they're doing a bad job. I think they, they're very clear that they need to squash passion if they're going to enhance predictability. So, hmm. so that's point number one. I think point number two is that the reason we put a lot of emphasis on passion is because we've done a lot of work looking at arenas where you see sustained extreme performance improvement. And in all of those arenas, there's one common element, which is deep passion of all the participants. And so if you understand that we're in a world of increasing pressure, where more rapid performance improvement is essential, not just an option, but necessary, then you've got to start focusing on passion as a way to drive that performance improvement through learning. 
that's, again, it, it drives you back into this pull model of how do I provide platforms where people can learn faster by drawing out the resources they need when they need them. But it's, a, again, a totally different mindset. And that passion to do something is a little bit unusual that we see all the time in these high-performance groups that we study, um, and that is a total willingness to collaborate and compete simultaneously with each other. Yes. And that's what keeps so what yeah what does it mean for someone for some, the you know people listening now how what is the advice in terms of I, I'm not I, I'm not passionate now my my as you said my my job actively squashes any passion I may may not even be aware that I where do I start how how does one knowing how critical this is it, how do I bring this into my life I mean. I, I think there are two elements. One is um, going through an exercise of figuring out, do you have passion? It may not be in your work. It may be outside of work in a particular arena. Um, and But where do you have passion? Uh, another avenue here is to look at your work and say, what are the elements in my work that I get really excited about? Um, and how can I start to build on and emphasize those elements and re redefine my work uh, or, you know, in, in extreme cases, if necessary, leave the company and find another uh, place where I can pursue those passions. But increasingly, we believe it's, it's essential to reintegrate passion and profession. You cannot just approach work as something you do to get a paycheck so that you can pursue your passion afterwards. In a world of increasing pressure, you're just going to end up feeling more and more stress if you're not passionate uh, and ultimately burn out or at least you know, fall behind in ways that are going to be very dysfunctional. And I think the one thing I would add is in the workplace, <laughs> start looking for other people yeah. who are kind of on the edge, who likewise are kind of rogue players, so to speak. They are willing to break out because they obviously have something, some itch as well. And do you find them, connect them? How do you build a social group amongst them? How do you build a support system? So you might actually, by kind of doing that, actually be able to amass some significant pressure to get certain other types of changes happening in your workscape. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so, and... I mean, it almost so, um, JP. You're saying that that uh, it almost before the passion, you can find that through people, through networks, through communication with the edge. Is that is that the idea? Well, or you find other people who are dissatisfied, mm. uh, and that dissatisfaction, um, some of that is going to be based because it doesn't touch any of the things they really care about. Is, is, um, and so how do you start to kind of give voice to what does matter? And in giving voice, you may start to discover what really matters to you. Uh, and you may find others that that connects to as well. And so suddenly you get an emergent substructure, you know, subgroup uh, coming together as a, um, you know, as, as a platform to, uh, to discuss and to reinforce. Well, I, you know, we're we're uh, almost out of time here. I, I had one last question. I, I I think we just talked about it, but I'll ask it um, anyway. Is there a single most important thing you think people need to do? I guess to to simplify, we just talked a lot about a lot of information. So, in a sense, trying to to consolidate a little bit, is there a single most important thing you think people need to do to leverage and exploit their um, their 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 new uh, understanding of, of of the power of pool and the world uh, that we're entering. Single thing, I I think at the end of the day, I w I would focus on this question of passion. Find your passion and find a way to integrate it into your work. Because if you don't do that, these techniques of pull are going to be really marginal in terms of the value that they provide. It's um, it, what becomes powerful is when you it ma match that passion with pull. 
passion helps you to pull in much more effective ways that, that will drive you to learn faster and improve your performance. And that's key in a more challenging world. And I think the one thing I would add, um, <clears throat> back to our discussion about shaping serendipity, is the absolute importance of spending time getting out of your own comfort zone and to to explore more actively things around you, to start to maybe unpack what is it that really intrigues you because you can be stuck in a rut um, and from inside the rut, you may never discover what your latent passion is. But if you actually kind of more creative in exploring things outside of that rut, then you may be much more effective of feeling the tingle inside you. It says, oh, what's going on here? And uh, so I think that that sense of, um, of you know, actively looking at how do you get out of your comfort zone and viewing it as a, as a way to, uh, to play a more active role in shaping luck, shaping serendipity. The paradox is that in times of increasing pressure, we tend to retreat into our comfort zones. We retreat to that which we're most comfortable with, when in fact the best way to deal with that increasing pressure is to get outside of your comfort zone. If you're not challenging yourself and constantly learning by going outside the comfort zone, you're going to end up just more and more stressed and burnt out. And just to end, it's something that we, we started out in the beginning, and I, it's actually one of my uh, main areas of, of sort of interest and in research right now, stories and storytelling, um, and, and the degree to which they serve as emotional transportation for passion and even sort of define who we are. And is, is, there, is there something to be said about the stories we tell ourselves or we tell um, to others um, that, that plays a part in, in all of this? A huge part. I, you know, one of the things that, again, a natural psychological reaction we all have in times of uncertainty is we magnify the perception of risk and uh, un, un, underemphasize the potential for reward. Um, and that tends to lead us to uh, either be paralyzed, not do anything, or be very tentative and marginal in what we do. Um, and I think that stories, and uh, I would even talk about narratives as open-ended stories um, that are opportunity-based, that highlight opportunity that's out there. And yes, be realistic about the challenges that you're going to face to address the opportunity, but be clear and, and compelling about the excitement of what's available there. Um, those kinds of stories and narratives play a huge role in terms of helping all of us get the, the motivation and, and uh, willingness to step outside our comfort zone and connect with people that, that um, ultimately will be extraordinarily valuable. And you know, the beauty of a story um, is it brings context as well as content. And so that deep interplay that comes out by creating a story for yourself, telling a story, listening to a story, then reapplying it in a new context, um, is that the story you know, has is framed in a way that I can often map it on to brand new types of situations as well. Um, and that's especially true of the story I tell myself. <laughs> well, that, uh, that will do it. Um, gentlemen, it's, it's been an honor speaking with you, and, and, uh, and it, was a, it was a pleasure sharing in your story. Um, I want to express my gratitude for taking the time to teach and share with me and our listeners the extraordinary work you're both doing. Thank, well, thank you. you. It's been great. Yep. Thank you very much. Until next time. Thank you for joining us. For transcripts of this program and a schedule of our upcoming events, please subscribe to our blog at blog.mygreenlight.com.